to FaceTime Fly Fishing. I am your host, Eric Strout. If you're at work currently, uh, try to look busy for the next 40 minutes. Uh, we've got some fly fishing to discuss. Uh, I've been sitting here busily uh, returning emails and texts uh, with people having trouble getting onto the site. So I'm going to try to remedy that uh, for next week's show. Fortunately, uh, all of these shows are archived on our website at www.ericstroutflyfishing.com and we get lots of views on these shows through the week uh, when people are able to, to watch them. We tried to pick a time in the middle of the week when like a hump day type thing when people might be at lunch and they might need a little bit of an escape from their, their job. I can't even say job. Uh, ugh, gives me the, gives me the, the willies. <laughs> But at any rate, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to have a great show today. We're going to talk about fishing like a predator. Uh, before we do that, a um, few things that I want to go over. You can contact me during the show. Uh, there are several ways to do that. One is you can send me an email at epstraup at gmail.com, or you can send me a text message at 814 five zero five four five six eight and of course you can use the the Google Plus um, question answer toggle there and there is a little bit of a delay with that but um, no worries I will get them and, and try to get to to all the questions if we have a lot um, <clears throat> recent videos that we have since uh, last week's show we put up two more interviews or uh, two more videos on our site. Uh, the first one was uh, Lefty Cray on Knots. This was uh, really fun. We went down and, and interviewed Lefty and had him talk a little bit about uh, Knots and what he spoke of was, was really interesting. It was not just how to tie certain knots. He talked about how to tie knots better. And if you're not a member of FaceTime Fly Fishing, uh, at, at ericstroutflyfishing.com. Go to the site, join the site. Uh, you can buy a three month, six month, or a 12 month uh, subscription to it. You're able to see this video. Um, it was really interesting. And Lefty brought, brought up a few things in that video that I didn't know. Um, not that I would know everything, but uh, some really simple common sense things that I never even thought about um, with regards to knots. So that was fun. And then at the end of that video, um, I came here in the in my studio here and, and tied them with mono um, with really good lighting. And I also tied the reverse clinch knot that I wrote about in Common Sense Fly Fishing. Uh, it's a knot I've been tying since I was a kid. It's a really good knot. Um, I have lots of guys that come and they fish with me and they watch me do that knot and they... they they want to learn how to do it. It's hard. It's really hard to describe how to tie it, but it's a very simple knot. But I tied that on the video. So uh, I had some some uh, some of our members requesting that I did, did that, and so I did. Um, that was the first video that we put out. The second one was a, a fly tying video um, that I just titled Fantastic Midge Pattern. It is a terrific pattern, uh, and I, I said in the video that you know, if we have any prayer of catching a trout on the surface for the next three months, um, it's going to be on a pattern that's very similar to that. And so I tied it. I tied it in a size 18, but you can tie it all the way down to 26 even. Um, so I uh, hope you enjoy that. Now, last week we talked about uh, fishing like a guide, and that was what I titled the topic. And the basic premise of that was when I say fish like a guide, I meant fish like your paycheck depended on. So many guys will go to one hole in the river, they go to one place that they're really familiar with, and as soon as they're not having success, they start changing their pattern, and before long they give up and they go home and they say, ah, oh, the fishing just wasn't any good. The topic of last week's talk, if you didn't get to see the show, um, was change water types. Think about, uh, there, there's a progression of thought as a guide 
that when I'm not having success in one particular type of water, I'm going to move and try a different type of water, and you may find them there. And so that was, that was the topic last week. Now this week, I want to take that one step further, and I want to talk about fishing like a predator. And for all of you archery hunters out there, anybody that's ever spent any time with a bow in the woods uh, knows what I'm talking about uh, in, as far as being a predator. You, you watch animals like deer move through the woods, and it's just the way that they move. They have a very rhythmic, and they're, they're really one with nature, and they are constantly on alert. All wild animals are like that. Um, trout, especially. A trout is a mid-range predator, meaning they're either going to eat something or they're going to get eaten by something. So they're always aware of what's around them. And so when we think about how we're going to uh, approach the stream and approach our fishing, we have to keep that in mind. That that we're chasing an animal that's that's worried about being caught, essentially. Um, so you know this process of fishing like a predator begins at home before you even leave. Uh, I always say, don't dress like you're going to an Easter egg convention. You know that's one of the things that it drives me insane. Look at me, I'm wearing pink today. <laughs> should have wore camouflage. My four-year-old said to me this morning when I dropped him off at school, he said, Daddy, why are you wearing pink? That's for little girls. <laughs> so I guess I should have changed my shirt for this talk. But uh, at any rate, dress so that you can blend in to the environment. You know, it, it drives me crazy when I, I have clients that come in and say late May or early June or mid-June even, Water's low, it's clear, the fish have been getting pounded for a, a couple of months, and somebody comes in and they're wearing a white shirt. And I can tell you that it doesn't always make a big difference, but quite often it does. And there's no reason to put yourself in a, in a bad position just by the clothes that you wear. So wear something that's going to blend in a little bit with the, uh, with the environment. Um, like I said, sometimes it doesn't matter. There are days you can go out there and, and wear whatever you want to wear and, and catch plenty of fish, but other times it does matter. So next we get into approach. So we're, we're going to dress the proper way, and now we approach the stream, and I always tell guys, don't just barge into the water. Approach the water cautiously and I, you know a really good rule for this is never tie your flies on at the vehicle always wait until you get down to the stream to tie your flies on because that actually makes you just stand there on the on the edge of the stream there's nothing wrong with observing before you step in you know that can be very important how many times have you gone down, you, you have this preconceived notion of, of what you're going to see on the river, and you get down there, and there's something completely different. Never rig your, your rod up, because you want to try to stall yourself. And we're always excited to get into the water and start fishing, but use as much restraint as you can. Stall yourself a little bit, get down to the edge of the stream, survey the situation, keep an eye out for for bugs and insects. You may see something that you totally didn't expect. Uh, you may decide once you get down there that uh, the water's a little lower or clearer than, than uh, you thought it was going to be, and maybe you've got to extend your leader a little bit or go lighter with your tippet. You don't know. But don't waste your fishing because you were impatient. Do it right, right, from, the, right from the beginning. So always wait to tie your flies on. The next thing is, I always talk about picking a target when you fish. You know, you, you come down and you look and you see a, a really nice, really nice run. Um, I'm always hesitant to, to put a, a less experienced angler in a situation like that where there's a real obvious sweet spot. I never want to walk away from them because they'll go right to that sweet spot. You want to pick your target area 
or identify it and then fish your way into it. So once you have that area identified, you know that that's, that's where you think you're going to get, get most of your action. You want to put yourself in a position to start where you can fish into that and not just barge into it. Okay. The other thing with that is very seldom can we go down to the stream, especially if you haven't fished for a week or two or a month or six months, you're not going to get right into the best water and just start fishing well. There's nothing wrong with picking out some marginal water and working the kinks out a little bit. Get your game on a little bit. Get your waiting legs. You know, that can be really, really important. Um, you don't want to barge around and make all kinds of ruckus in the water, spook all of your fish. You're just going to make it tougher for yourself. So pick some marginal water and work your way into your into your target. It, it never fails. Uh, the, what I spoke of with, with a client or a, uh, you know an inexperienced client, you put them in a really sweet run and you say, this is going to be yours. And I would look at that water and I, it would probably take me an hour to fish it. And in three or four minutes, they're at the top end of it. And, you know, they've pretty much ruined all of that, that water. So just take your time. I, you know, patience is really the key to good fishing. Um, just take your time and, and, and fish into it. I always talk about footprints on the stream. Um, one of the things that I think are, is so important when you talk about fishing like a predator it's how you move through the water. Um, if you have the opportunity, uh, say you're going to move locations in the water, if you have the opportunity to walk out, get out of the stream and move up to the new location and then move back in, that's almost always better than barging up through the water. Um, sound travels very easily in water. And you know, if you wear cleats, I wear cleats a lot of the times. If anyone's ever fished the Little Juniata, you know it's a treacherous stream. It's very slippery. Penn's Creek is the same way. I wear cleats, and they make noise. So you've got to be aware of that and know that every time you take a step, you're going to be alerting the fish that you're there, and particularly in slow water. Uh, if you've got flat water, sound travels like that through it. Now, if you can move through ripples and things like that, that's a little different. That, that'll muffle your, your, uh, your traveling sound a lot better than, than flat water. But be conscious of the fact that as you move through the stream, you're going to be making noise. And, you know, I, I always try to tell my guys that the, the fish don't hear that and go, oh, there's a fisherman coming. I'm going to have to get out of Dodge here. They just recognize it as a threat. You know, half of the threats, maybe more, to a trout come from outside of the water. I mean, minks, birds, herons, eagles, ospreys. So they are extremely conscious of anything that's above them or, or coming through the water. Uh, there's minks and, and all sorts of different weasels that are, that are uh, pretty treacherous to trout. So they're, they're very wary of that stuff, and you've got to be conscious of that. Carry a waiting staff. I can tell you, you know, you, you always think, oh, I don't need a waiting staff. It helps you be a little more stealthy. And I can tell you, you know, when I can put that third point of contact down on the stream bottom, I can be a lot more gentle with my feet, and I'm not sliding around as much. You know, when you have spikes on your on your boots and you slide off of a rock, it makes a sound. So when you have that third point of contact down on the stream bottom, it really enables you to place your feet a little easier. You're not transferring 100% of your weight from one foot to the other. You've got that third point of contact there, and it's you can actually walk lighter in the water. So a staff is not just for keeping you up in fast water. It's also for being able to be a little quieter and a little stealthier to move into position. Um, plan your movements. If you know 
what water you're going to fish and you know how you're going to fish it, plan the way you're going to move through there. Um, I always talk about quartering a stream and I, I, I dissect it like a grid where I'll go fish straight across and then I'll back out and I'll move up a couple of feet and I'll fish out again. Really plan how you're going to do that and it'll help you a lot. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about with this is by far the most important. We can do all of these things right, but the most important thing is to fish upstream to the fish. Remember that trout always face the current. Now, if they're in a back eddy, they could be facing the opposite way, but they always face current. Current's got to be coming through their gills. And so the best way to sneak up on a wild animal is to come from behind it. And I see a lot of guys that go in, uh, you know, and I'll tell you, you can get away with upstream fishing or downstream fishing, rather, early in the season. A lot of times the water's up a little bit. Um, they don't know you're there because there's a lot of water and there's a lot of noise in the water and the fish are really hungry. But when you start to get into the season and we're starting to imitate a lot of insects that are in the water and the fish are getting really keyed into to certain bugs, you're going to have a real tough time fishing downstream to those fish unless you're fishing a lot of distance. Now, if you've got, got an indicator on and you're fishing 35 feet from you downstream, that's totally different. But most of the time in trout fishing, we're fishing fairly close. And I can't stress enough that the best way to, to sneak up on a trout is in a place where he can't see you. So really focus your fishing upstream. That is one of the most important things. The next thing with that is to keep an angle, keep a proper angle to, to, to catch the fish. You know, now we start to get into fishing technique a little bit, but you don't want to be directly behind a trout because your line is going to spook the trout when you, when you cast to them. You're going to have a better angle if you get off to the side a little bit. So plan your fishing routes that way. Know that you're going to stay behind. You're going to fish upstream at an angle. And that's how you want to move through the water. It's, uh, it's critical that you're able to do that and plan it. Now, I got some emails. It takes a real man to wear pink. I like that. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> I like that. Actually, I was out of laundry. So... <laughs> I wore this shirt because I was out of laundry. I got a comment on the purple soft tackle. If you're if you're a member um, of of FaceTime Fly Fishing with uh, with our website, there's a fly on there that I did last week called the purple soft tackle, and I, I blended the dubbing for it. Um, thank you very much. And the question was, will it work anywhere else? Absolutely. That fly, I, I fished it in Montana. When I got it out there, I, I fished it quite a bit. Um, it worked really well. I've actually caught steelhead on that fly as well. So it'll work. Uh, I tie them real big for steelhead, and uh, I've, I've done quite well on them. So that was from Ray Markowitz. Ray, by all means, tie them in all different sizes and, and, and uh, fish it. it. It'll work. So the next thing, I want to talk about what we've got coming up. Um, and please, if you have any questions or comments about uh, the fish like a predator, please feel free to, to send them in. A um, couple of things on the horizon. Uh, we have got a, a Christmas Day special. It's going to be called Christmas Day with Lefty Cray. And this is the full interview. If you go on our site, you can see a teaser to the interview that I did with Lefty. But this is a full interview um, where Lefty talks about everything from uh, World War II to how he got his start in, in the fishing business. Uh, it's a fascinating interview. He's a fascinating man. And for FaceTime members, it's going to be called Christmas Day with Lefty Cray. And that's going to be released Christmas morning. So uh, look forward to that. 
this coming week, I've got a lot of requests for the sulfur nymph. And so I am going to tie the sulfur nymph this coming week uh, for our tying video. And I'm also going to blend the dubbings. And I'm going to show you a couple of different dubbings that I use for that at uh, different points of the hatch for the nymphs. And uh, it, it, it can be really critical. Um, sometimes, certain years, it, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you can use a very generic pattern. Sometimes pheasant tails work as good as anything. Um, other times, they get really keyed in on certain uh, shades of, of, of that nymph. And <clears throat> so I'm going to show you every option that I use with the sulfur nymph. And it's probably going to be a long a long, uh, a long video, but I am going to uh, to show you everything that I'm doing there. I've got an email here I want to check. I'm not coming through on this computer yet. It's wonderful to have two computers going at the same time. <laughs> I can barely make one go in the in, at the right speed. But the sulfur nymph is going to be next, um, so look look forward to that. And I'm getting a lot of comments about blending dubbings. Um, so I, I think we're going to show you some of that stuff. I've got a good friend of mine coming this weekend, and we're going to do some, some uh, filming, Kevin Compton. If any of you are, are familiar with him, he is a remarkable fly tire. He was uh, a tire for the USA men's national team. Um, he has an importing business where he imports. If you see a lot of the competition style hooks that I that I tie on, that I am completely sold on, uh, I buy a lot of those hooks from Kevin. He's the guy that imports them into the country, and and uh, he is a phenomenal fly tire. We're, he's going to have a couple of patterns that we're going to showcase for you on our fly tying segments. But I'm going to talk to him also about fly design, and. He and I always have interesting discussions about the way that flies become uh, designs. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been on the stream and, and I, I see a condition that something's occurring that uh, I don't have a fly to match it. Uh, I'll give you an example. I, I wrote about this in, in uh, River Pimp. I had a day where the, the, we were fishing the sulfurs and I had a group of clients and the fish were really mid-range. I mean, right in the middle of the water, eating nymphs. And I didn't have anything. I had a real hard time getting my nymph right to the level where they were feeding. And once I got there, I was dialing in the weight and everything else. Once I got there, I couldn't get the fish to eat it. Well, I went out, and I, I got a seine, and I went out in the current, and I collected these nymphs. And I can't tell you how big the thorax was swelled on these sulfur nymphs. It was huge. It looked uh, unnatural, but they were really swelled up. And so I went back that night and I tied these patterns and I, I went out the next day and sure enough, same thing happened and we did really well. We caught a lot of fish and it was just getting the, getting the nymph to the right level. I've never seen that condition since, but I still carry the flies with me. But that's how that design came about. Um, I tell another story about a, a group that came during the sulfurs, and one of the members of the group was just into fly fishing, and he was really into it. He was tying bugs and everything else, and he was very new. I think he had been into it for about six months or so, and I'm tying sulfur nymphs on for everybody. It was uh, midday, and I said, we're going to nymph during the day, and then you know, hopefully tonight we'll get the hatch, and I... I got ready to tie a sulfur nymph on for him, and he said, no, I'll use my own flies. And he pulled his sulfur nymphs out, and they were bright yellow. And he just made the assumption that since the dry fly was yellow, that the nymph was probably yellow too. Well, I said, you know, that's not really what color the nymphs are. I said, you want one of my flies? He said, no, I'd like to fish my own patterns. I said, okay. So I went with the other guys, and I figured, you know, couple hours when these guys are catching fish and he's not, he'll want a sulfur nymph. <laughs> Lo and behold, we get into the stream and it's not five minutes, boom, he's got, got one on. My guys don't have anything yet. Ten minutes later, boom, he's got another one on. All day long, he was the high rod. There was no question about it. I think he caught about 15 fish and the other guys caught six or seven maybe. 
and they had a lot more experience than he did. <laughs> so I went home that night, and I tied a bunch of yellow sulfur nymphs. I've never caught a fish on them since. But just this, you know, you just never, ever know. So there's always a good reason to have as many options in your fly box as possible. I always talk about that I carry, I probably carry uh, several thousand flies in my chest box. And I probably use about a dozen of them. <laughs> but so it goes, you know. So I got another question here. I can read the daggone thing. Question, this is a good question. When you, how do you determine how far away to stay from the fish? This is, a, this is good. Um, back into the, the predatory mode that we were talking about. Um, I have a general rule. If the water is, is, is flat and it's shallow, so if I'm working my way upstream and it's flat, shallow water, there are many times during the, during the year that you'll have fish that are in that type of water. I never want to get more than or closer than 25 or 30 feet from those fish before I put a cast on. Never. Um, always try. I, I think of when I'm moving upstream, generally the, the heavy part of the current is in the middle, okay, and the lighter, shallower water is going to be from the middle to the edge. I start fishing far directly ahead of me and then shorten it up as I come back into the current. So if I'm fishing the water that's directly ahead and it's calm and it's, it's shallow and flat, I am going to get some distance on those casts because those fish are going to spook a lot easier than the fish that are actually in the current. So you have to use your discretion there. But and, and every watershed's different. Um, there's a lot of places, you know, in Spruce Creek, for example, that's that's uh, a lot of it's private and in, in the public areas get pounded, and the fish are almost conditioned to people being in the water. So they won't spook as as easily as as they would in a in a wild stream. Now in the Little Juniata River, um, fish that are on the edges, there are times of year where you can't get within 50 feet of those fish. Um, I had a trip this past fall where we actually fished and, and waded up through a section of river that I've never done that in. Uh, the water was so low this year. And we had rising fish in front of us and we could not get within 50 feet of those fish. Every time we put a cast on one, it would move up a little bit. would take a few steps and try to move up in there, and fish would, would keep that distance from us. It was unbelievable. We, you know, So you've got to use your discretion a little bit, but when you have the opportunity to fish a longer line and you can do it effectively, take that opportunity um, because once you spook a fish, you're not just spooking that fish. It's going to spook into an area and quite possibly spook more fish. So that's one of the reasons that stealth is so important. Um, always be conscious of the fact that those fish know you're there. And if they don't know you're there, you're going to have a much better shot at catching them. So always think about that. Always think, what can I do to hide my presence? You know, and if you can fish further away from you, you're going to do much better than you would if you if you were to walk right up on it. Um, it's almost always a good bet. And I watch these guys in in midsummer, the the guys that are really good, that are throwing beetles and ants and things like that. They're they're fishing 60 feet away from them in some cases, and that's hard. It's really hard to do on a trout stream, but if you can do it, that's that's the name of the game. And the reason that they're successful is because those fish don't have any idea that they're there. 
that's one of the keys to, to really good brookie fishing. Um, if you ever watch Joe Humphrey's brookie fish, he's fishing two pools ahead of him. You know, and not because he just likes casting, but because those fish don't know he's there. Brookies, if you get the fly there, they'll eat it, as long as they don't know you're there. You know, they're about the spookiest fish on the planet. You know, if you walk up into a brookie, brookie pool and, and they see you, it's, it's game over. So, you know, we fish big wolves for them, but you've got to fish way out ahead of you. And if you can do that, you can be really successful. That's sort of where, if you really want to learn stealth, go to a brook, brook trout stream. You know, put a big royal wolf on, a, a 3X leader, and go to town. You'll learn how to be stealthy. That's uh, just the way it is. Uh, you've got to fish out ahead of you. And if you're going to fish close, which sometimes you have to do on a, on a brush stream, if you're going to fish close, you've got to stay behind something. You've got to be quiet. Um, all of those things come into play. I actually, for a, a period of time, one year we had really good water. We had lots of water uh, in the summertime. It never really got low. And I would take new beginning anglers to a brook trout stream, and we would brook trout fish before we went to the big river. And I was amazed. I thought it would be a disaster, but it, it, it actually happened as an accident a little bit. Uh, I had some guys that just wanted to do that, and two of them had never fished before. And so I had three guys total, and we just took turns um, with, with one rod going up through a brookie stream. They got so good at managing line, at tight little casts, very little movement. You know, if you've got a, a movement issue with your casting, go up into the mountains because <laughs> every, every error that you have in your casting stroke will, will put you in a tree. So they learned in a matter of, of a day how to handle a rod, how to handle the line. And we went down on the river and absolutely cleaned up. Um, it is a great way to learn exactly what I'm talking about and to tighten up your, your entire game. Uh, line control is so important in the brush. You, you've really got to have that line under your finger and be able to control your slack and everything else. Casting goes without saying. I mean, to be able to cast in the brush um, is is a, an essential skill and it will really make you a better caster on the big waters. So anybody ever wants to do that, you call me. We've got great brookie streams here in Central PA. Uh, it is a great way to tighten up your game. And we've actually, we're, we have a video uh, that we're going to do on the mountain streams and, and I think I'm going to actually do it with Joe Humphrey. So uh, we had some discussion about it. We were trying to get it done before the winter time came, but uh, it's it's totally winter now. So tomorrow, uh, I'm going out. The high tomorrow is 15 degrees. It's going down into the single digits tonight. <clears throat> I'm going to go out. I'm going to fish the little junior out of tomorrow on camera. Uh, I don't know what we're going to catch. Uh, I'm not real, real hopeful. <laughs> but I want to go through the progression of thought in cold weather fishing tomorrow and um, want to do a video on it and so you may see that as early as uh, I may release that on Friday if I'm if I'm able to get it done uh, it's going to be brutal tough conditions but what I want to do I get lots of questions um, from guys that, that that say they do really well in April May and June but when it comes this time of year and it's cold they they get their rear ends handed to them and my response to that is we all get our rear ends handed to us this time of year. Um, but it's great to be out. You know? So what I'm going to do tomorrow is in this cold weather, I'm going to go through and um, go through every progression that I go through with, with uh, the cold weather. And we'll see if we catch any fish or not. Um, at any, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, I'd really like to get some midge fishing. Uh, there are some midges around that have been decent, but it's going to be tough with with uh, 15 degree air temperatures. So, 
we'll see what happens, and uh, we'll, we'll give it our best shot. want to make one final commercial for our website. If you're not a member of FaceTime Fly Fishing, please visit www.ericstroutflyfishing.com and take a look at, at our site. We've got several videos up there that are public, but there are lots that are membership only. Take a look at it. You can buy a three-month, six-month, or a 12-month membership. It's a great gift idea for your angling friends or loved ones. So take a look at it. See what you think. I also have signed copies of River Pimp and signed copies of Common Sense Fly Fishing available. Give us a call or shoot us an email. Be happy to send those out immediately. Um, thank you so much for your participation. I have to tell you our numbers are, are going up with our views on this. Uh, most people watch it during the week sometime when, they, when it's convenient, but it's been terrific. We've gotten lots of good response. Please always let me know what you're thinking. If there's something that you want to discuss um, in particular, let me know. Uh, we have lots of options on the programming. So in the meantime, happy holidays, everyone. And until next time, good fishing.